I'm Jace Lacob, and you're listening to Masterpiece Studio. Since season one of Sanditon, the compassionate Mary Parker has provided unwavering support to her visionary husband, Tom, even through some of his darkest hours. I've let my investors down. I've let my friends down, my family down, most of all. I've let you down, Mary. What can you think of me? Tom, stop that. I can't bear to see you punishing yourself. This is a misfortune, but somehow we'll come through it. How can I face people after this? I don't care what anyone says. I absolutely believe in you, Tom. And I love you. So there. But in this final season, Tom teams up with investor Roly Price on a project that pushes beyond the boundaries of Mary's support, a vision for a future Sanditon that collides with Mary's unerring belief in what is right and just. Ah, Mr. Colbert, a splendid afternoon. Mr. Price has just told me of your scheme for the Old Town. Oh, yes? You realize if you raise the Old Town, you will destroy the last vestiges of the community that has always been the heart of Sanditon. Well, I, um... I have to say I agree with you, Mr. Colburn. I believe we should be seeking to improve the lives of the people that live there, not ruin them. Mary holds an obligation to Mrs. Filkins, a former maid for the Parkers and an Old Town resident. Like many women of the era, Mary indulges in charitable visits, bringing Mrs. Filkins' family food and supplies. Tom's plan for his grand hotel would spell disaster for Old Town, displacing its current residents, including the downtrodden Filkinses. Mary, we'll leave as soon as the meeting is over, so I'll be back in good time to welcome the Montrezes and, of course, to meet How could you? You served them eviction notices. What did you think was going to happen? I thought, I, I hoped that your conscience would stop you, that you realize what you were doing is immoral. It is merely business. It is wrong. Mrs. Filkins is caring for a sick child. We have a responsibility. It is my opinion count for nothing. This is all for you. Don't you see? This is for our future, our children's future. No. All I see is a man who has lost his way. You are no longer the Tom Parker I married. Actor Kate Ashfield joins us to discuss how Mary Parker finds her voice by pushing against the dreams of her husband, the very same dreams she'd been propping up since season one, and how that voice can have lasting implications for the little town by the sea. This week, we are joined by Sanditon star Kate Ashfield. Welcome. Thank you. Very, very pleased to be here. Pleased to have you. Mary Parker is one of my favorite characters on Sanditon. Jane Austen describes her as, quote, gentle, amiable, sweet-tempered woman, the properest wife in the world for a man of strong understanding, but not of a capacity to supply the cooler reflection which her own husband sometimes needed. I'd say that your Mary breaks away from that description entirely. (laughs) I mean, her first line of dialogue in Sanditon, to me, is particularly telling. She says, My dear, I think we're going the wrong way. Nonsense, my dear, this is the way. You'll see I'm right. Looking back, does that moment capture Mary's perspective perfectly? I think it captures both of them perfectly, doesn't it? It's You're absolutely right. That's their marriage summed up. He definitely thinks he's right. And even when he's given warnings, he's still, no, 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 we're on the right road until he comes to realise that Mary was right all along. And the carriage is now upside down. uh, Exactly. Too late to (laughs) do anything about it. I mean, Austin goes so far as to sort of say that Mary is, quote, useless, which is the furthest thing from the truth. I mean, she becomes, over the course of these three series, a deeply sympathetic character who... I'd say sort of attempts to balance the excess of her husband's sense with her own sensibility. How would you describe Mary and Tom's marriage? Well, I think it's a really strong marriage. But um, By the time you get to season three, particularly, I think you feel that, that they're in a very good place, they're very happy together, and that they enable each other to be themselves. And so Mary does allow Tom to, to do what he wants in Sanderton, but she is the moral compass behind him when he does things that she doesn't think are right for the people in the town for example you know she will speak up and have her say and 
and really, yeah, she is a force to be reckoned with then. But I think it's a really healthy relationship. And yeah, I think it gets tested several times. But I think I think over overall I you know, my feeling was that I think they're a lovely couple together. And as we see this season, that we, they are definitely tested, as you say, particularly over the, the future of this Sanditon endeavor, which we'll talk about in a little bit. In that first episode, the, the carriage overturning is a pivotal moment that brings Mary face to face with Charlotte Haywood, which kicks off the entire narrative of Sanditon. Tom invites Charlotte to stay with them as long as she likes, and Mary is quite happy to go along with this plan. What do you think Mary makes of Charlotte Haywood initially? I think she was very pleased to have Charlotte around and that Charlotte was a breath of fresh air, really, coming to Sanderton. And she was learned and interested in being her own person and and not necessarily wanted to get married. But I think but Mary saw all the benefits of being married and and wanted the best for Charlotte. But I, so I think at the, I definitely think at the beginning she she thought she was a wonderful person to have around. Mary becomes a confidant for Charlotte and Charlotte for Mary. And and I do see that their relationship sort of shifts over the course of these three series. Does Mary ultimately become something kind of akin to a surrogate mother for Charlotte? Or by the end, have they sort of reached a place where they're on equal footing? Oh, uh, well, that's a good question. I think my my feeling was that she was kind of a surrogate mother. Um, but you're right, towards the end, they I think Charlotte really has grown up. And, you know, they are definitely on more equal footing. I think you're right, because Charlotte's so clever and there's so much to learn from her as well. Mary remains a supportive figure throughout the run of Sanditon, but there are signs that she can push back against Tom when she needs to. Uh, We see that in series one when she learns at the cricket match that Tom hasn't paid the workers. Mm -hmm. Uh, She says, for so long I felt duty bound to keep my own counsel, but I can stay silent no longer. Stop, Tom. Open your eyes for once. How did you read that moment for Mary when you came to it? What does it take for her to finally begin to confront her husband about the truth? Well, I think I think as soon as she found that out, that she felt duty-bound morally to confront him. But I, I guess it says a lot about the time, doesn't it, that she would sit quiet and and not you not question his authority and and, and his decisions for for a long time. I mean, you have the same in season two, don't you, as well, when she really gets very cross with him then for um, for what he's done and, and throwing everything away and gambling just seems so ridiculous to her after the sacrifices that Sydney made. So, yeah, I mean, I think I think she 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 gets stronger, but I, I guess it, I guess it was indicative of the time that people just wives probably wouldn't stand up to their husbands. I mean, she she says at one point to him, I never thought you were silly or vainglorious, and I don't think that now. I love the way you wanted to change the world. She also says of him, sometimes I fear he'll keep adding and obsessing until one day he drops down dead with the plan still clutched in his hand, which to me is yeah. is very telling. And I do think you're right. I think she she sort of is this sort of Regency-era model for constancy in a way that most women today would be far more outspoken towards their husband for doing the things that Tom actually does. But she does represent this kind of old sort of Regency era sort of woman who is willing to support her husband and go along with this until a point. And I feel like we reach that point in series three. Yes, I totally agree. And there was there was another way we looked at it when we were doing season one before we get into season three, which is, which is that there was something kind of rock and roll about Tom that he was trying to set up this town and it was a, it was all a bit you know he was all a bit it was about out there you know he was doing something that other people just wouldn't do and I think that she was kind of excited and, and respected that so I think that there is an element where she doesn't think he's vainglorious she doesn't think he's stupid there's just other things that he does that that are, that she thinks are wrong, but yeah. But I think the whole the whole idea of it, she has, he has her support, and I think they 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 move from a lovely house in London to Sanditon, and so she's made her sacrifices for it too. Um, on her own with the kids and not knowing people and trying to trying to be a good wife to him there. But uh, so I think you're absolutely right. I think I think um, 
they start in a really good place. And yeah, by season three, things are things are really tough because he seems to have, yeah, crossed a line. I mean, as you say, he he is this great dreamer. He has this project. He has this goal. He has this dream. His entire family sort of come along. They support him, even as he sort of trips and falls at times and makes errors. And in season three, though, or in series three, Tom turns to Mary for for advice about what he calls his his second wife, this great project of Sanditon. Yeah. And Mary suggests the ideal location for a grand hotel would be on top of a hill overlooking the old town. Rowley wants to build on top of people's houses, and Tom says it will never happen. Does Mary believe him when he says that to her? I think she does. I think I think I think she's delighted to be asked her opinion. And and that's you know, that's a good example of, of how modern their, their relationship was in some ways. You know, he I think they, they do really adore each other and and she she wants to be involved with it but i think i think at that point in time she does believe him because she she's so sure it's a, the wrong thing to do that why would anyone want to do that and he does give her assurances doesn't he that he won't flat out he says it yeah um, i think she's shocked shocked but you know that thing where you're shocked but not a hundred percent surprised <laughs> no they haven't done it again you know <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, those the charitable visits that that she pays to her former maid, Mrs. Filkins, paint a, a different side of Mary. One that is actually more worldly than Tom, who who often does have his head in the clouds, and that the struggle facing the poor are visible to Mary in a way that they're not to Tom. He sort of sees them as, in the abstract that they are just sort of an an obstacle to be overcome, and not living, breathing human beings. Who are just trying to survive. But Mary's also frank about the fact that those visits give her a purpose outside of the home. It's not just a kindness. It's nice to find an occupation outside being a wife and a mother. Rewarding, as that is, of course. Do you see Mary, our sort of clever, smart Mary, struggling against those period expectations of what motherhood is or what wifehood means? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think um I think she she is does get bored. She does want something that's that gives her a purpose. And I think as her kids grow up um and you know she doesn't have a job, I think um I think it must have been difficult for lots of women. And I think that's what's so great about the books that you you get to you get to see their inner life and, and you know that that um you know they they can read and they can paint and they can but they, they there's not that much to do is there no they have these sort of accomplishments that they you know whether it's sort of needlepoint or as you say sort of painting um that sort of fill the time but they're they're not given opportunities to be sort of productive uh and those that are whether it's sort of the brontes or jane austen herself are sort of outliers for women at this time I mean the 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 carriage ride after she she shares her views to Rowley are particularly fraught as Tom chastises her for speaking out of turn. Uh, I do wish you'd spoken to me in private, my dear. Just because I am Mrs. Tom Parker doesn't mean I'm not entitled to my own opinion. Instead of undermining me in front of our host. And I am allowed to voice. Them. And Mr. Price, it is business, Mary. Since when did you care only for profit? I cannot afford to be sentimental. It does seem that this is the breaking point for Mary, where she's being put second to profit. Yes. Uh, and she's she's not willing to sort of go along with this anymore. That's right. She's been second to the business all the way throughout, hasn't she? In, in what you said earlier, that it, Tom has two wives, you know, one is Sanderton. And she says that right at the beginning of season one to Charlotte. And she, and I think, and she thinks she's kind of happy with that. She's made, she's made her peace with that. But he is an obsessive and he is his own person. But I think she does get to the point where she says, I, you know, she has played second fiddle, but she is a person who has her own voice. And, and Rowley's vision is just abhorrent to her. And yeah, she can't, she can't sit quietly. And there is a new sort of iciness introduced in Mary and Tom's marriage as he he feels betrayed by Mary finding her footing and her voice. Uh, at the dance, he says, I'm not sure I like the woman you've become. 
And at the fireworks, there is this sort of vast chasm opening up between them. What does Mary make of, of Tom's reaction? And, and did she expect it to be quite as fierce as it is? Um, I think she probably knew she was playing with fire. I, but I think it's I think it's Charlotte's influence. I think it's I think it's the it is it is finding her agency in that sense that she she's creative. She does something, and I think she knows it's wrong in terms of how what Tom would think. But uh, yeah, I don't think she cares at that point. I think she's she thinks she's had enough, and um, she thinks of something that Charlotte would do. She she believes in it so wholeheartedly that. I think she's prepared to weather the storm of the relationship because she has to. I mean, she, to me, should be given sainthood for what she's put up with until this <laughs> point. So, yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, she, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's a lot has been asked to, of Mary Parker over, over three series. Uh, and I'm glad that she, she does finally put her foot down I mean, she always seems to be on the side of what is right. And I'm using that in sort of air quotes. Um, sure. Do you feel like there's any area where she does fall short? Is it her sort of, until now, her sort of unerring support for her husband as dreamy as he is? Or do you see a, another flaw that she might have? Um, well, I, 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 I think you're right. I think if she had... If she had got a bit more involved in the accounts, for example, then I think it would have been a better, easier journey for everybody. And um, I mean, Charlotte gets involved in Sanderton in, in season one with the um, architecture of it and everything. And I, but I think if if Mary if Mary had been doing the books, I think it would I think it would have been better because they wouldn't have had they would have paid people on time and she would have known what was going on. And then Tom wouldn't have hidden things from her. But I guess it was such an unusual thing to do at that point in time that she wouldn't have even thought about it. Probably not. Probably mm. not. But if she had, I mean, there probably would be no show. So we have, <laughs> to, <is> true. <laughs> we have to be thankful for that. Yes, true. In this week's episode, Mary tries to get through to Tom. Mary, for the last time, please understand. This hotel will bring prosperity to Sanderson. It will bring jobs and a better future for all. At what cost? It is not too late, particularly when there are so many sick. You can still do what is right. But it's only later that Mary learns from Mrs. Filkins that the residents of the Old Town have been served with eviction notices, and Tom has already sold the land out from underneath the workers that actually built Sanditon. How entirely mortifying is this for Mary to learn? Oh, I think it's the worst. And I think, yeah, I think she, 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 she genuinely can't. She can't believe it. She can't believe he would have done that. She's so shocked and horrified and ashamed. That's the lowest point she gets to in terms of their relationship. And I, I compared her to a saint uh, a few minutes ago, and, and I do think she is. And she she confronts him about all of his actions, saying that she thought he would realize his actions were immoral. She says, all I see is a man who has lost his way. You are no mm -hmm. longer the Tom Parker I married. After the fire, the bankruptcy, Sydney's sacrifice, these very selfishly grandiose plans, how does Mary now look back and read her support of Tom over the years? Is she angry at herself? Maybe, but I didn't feel like that. I felt like, and this could just be me, but I, I felt that she had kept trying, and I think the thing that he'd lost his way is, is how she felt, that I think she felt like everything had that, that had happened along the way. I mean, yes, he's let her down, but I think she she'd forgiven him everything up to that point. That there were just things that he'd done, but um, because I don't think she really thought things were deliberately done. I mean, apart, apart from not paying the workers, even then, it was like she, you should have told me, and we could have worked something out. Kind of attitude to it. Whereas um, this is a deceit, and he knows exactly what he's doing, and so that I think I think it becomes a really different thing for her. Before this next question, a brief word from our sponsors. Ocean voyages, expeditions, river journeys. Viking is dedicated to bringing travelers closer to the destination. 
offering a small ship experience and a shore excursion in every port. Learn more at viking.com. With the death of Sidney Parker, Tom and Mary become guardians to Georgiana. How would you describe Mary's dynamic with Georgiana, and, and how does Georgiana's trial in Series 3 sort of shift or crystallize that? I think she becomes a mother figure to her too, and she becomes very protective. I think they, they end up having a very good relationship. I think the trial brings them closer together, and, and Mary goes with her and Charlotte to the court. I think I think that that's... I think that, that it's it, it's an, a, a window into Georgiana's vulnerability that um, Mary probably hadn't seen before. But Mary's so observant and watches everybody. She kind of gets a sense of lots of things because she just sits back a bit, doesn't she? So she knows from the beginning that it'd be nice for Georgiana to have Charlotte there and, and some company. And she sees the things that are difficult for her. Um, but yeah, I think they just they, be, they become closer as the season goes on, I think. It's at Georgiana's engagement dinner that Mary falls ill, rather unexpectedly falling to the floor. Were you mm-hmm. surprised that her story would would take this turn, or, or given the sickness that's spreading throughout the town, is this the most likely outcome of her charitable exercises? No, I was very surprised. And when I found out about it, <laughs> I was so shocked. <laughs> I, because... I just asked one of the new directors, said, what's going to happen in, you know, in the next few episodes? Because we, we would get them bit by bit. And they said, Mary gets really ill. And I said, you're joking. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. But um, because I think, I think we didn't really know about what was going on in the old town then either. So we didn't know that people were getting ill. But I, I, guess, it, I guess it's true all these things did happen. And I, um, yeah. It's only here that Tom seems to finally realize what he might lose if Mary dies. Uh, there's one final episode of Sanditon before it sails over the horizon. Uh, what can you tease about what the final episode holds for Mary Parker? Well, see, if if I'm not doing any spoilers, I can't say much because I think Mary's life is in the balance. Um, but I think when you see Tom's reaction to to Mary being ill you really realise that he knows he's made a big mistake, don't you? And I I think the last thing he wants to do is lose Mary. Hmm. Uh, Georgiana and Charlotte present different versions of Austin heroines, but I'm curious, looking at Sanditon as a whole, how do you see Mary Parker fitting into the pantheon of, of Austin heroines? Well, I guess she, again, she's, she is quite strong, even though she's quite quiet and um yeah i think i think she's she does you know she does sort of follow behind them in a way because she's she's from the generation before to become a bit more independent live her own life a little bit more so i think yeah i think she's she is another one of austin's heroines like that and certainly she does become it in our series a bit more doesn't she absolutely your first on-screen role was in 1994 as Princess Caribou, opposite Phoebe Cates. Uh, what do you remember of this production? Oh, I was so nervous. I really enjoyed it because it was my first job. I remember the very first day we were shooting. It was the first time I'd ever been on camera or anywhere near a camera, so I, I just didn't know how it all worked. And um, I had to run across the lawn and bang a gong say that dinner was served and as I banged the gong the end of the gong flew off and hit the cameraman on the head (laughs) (laughs) oh no this is gonna be terrible you're bright bright red and I remember then the very last uh scene that we shot on Princess Caribou it was a scene where I was meant to be crying around the table because Princess Caribou was leaving and um all of the servants were sitting around the table and the makeup artist put some, um, there's this kind of menthol crystals that she was blowing in my eyes to make me cry. Tear stick is what they call it. That's it. And, um, and so, so she, she puts them in and, and it was, it was the last shot of the whole film. So everyone was, you know, was gearing up to kind of, you know, clap and it'll all be over. And we were in a hurry to finish the day. Anyway, I said, Oh, it's not working. I said, there's, there's no tears. It's not working. So they put a lot more in. Oh God! <laughs> I remember just 
clutching Kevin Klein's arm. He's going, I can't open my eyes. And I'm, <laughs> quick, 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 I watched me. And I like, watched him. And I said, I'm ready now, I'm ready now. I was just mortified. I was really, really crying by then. I said, I'm ready. <laughs> and Kevin Klein looked at me and went, Oh no, you come up in a rash. <laughs> I just got so red. My whole guess was that, but yeah, because I was so nervous and so embarrassed, and you know, I was messing it up for everybody else. And then he said the sweetest thing. He went, "I've seen that once before on Meryl Streep." I was oh. Like, oh, bless him. Thank bless. You. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, Anyways, that's anyway, so that, but that kind of sums up my whole time. It was great fun. I loved doing it, but I, but I really was learning on the job and I was very, very nervous. Yeah. I mean, after, after a string of extremely intense projects, including Blasted, Closer and This Little Life, you, you gave an interview to The Independent in 2003 in which you said, drama should make us confront our emotions. As an actor, is that still a motivating factor for choosing the roles you do? Are you still drawn to intensity? Um, yeah, I'm drawn to, to to just to try and understand things more, I guess. So understand why people do what they do or how we feel about certain things. And yeah, I mean, it it, it depends what 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 you get um, what you get given to do. But I but I so I get. But I guess it's making everything relatable so that you know when you watch something, you you think, oh, you know, it's always this question of how would I respond in that situation. We got to see how you would respond uh, to a zombie apocalypse because a year after giving that interview, you start as Liz in Edgar Wright's zombie rom-com, Shaun of the Dead. How did Shaun change the trajectory of your career or your life? Um, ooh, uh, well, there's people that really love that film and, and it's so nice to meet them. I met one the other day, just sit, I was sitting, um, in a bar and um, a guy on the table next to me was saying, it's my favourite film. And people really they like it, really, really like it and watch it and watch it, you know. So that's been really nice. You have no idea when you make a film what people are going to make of it, you know. And um, and I think um, I think it was, it was a kind of surprise that, that people liked it so much, but, I, but we had such a great time doing it and making it. But I guess it's I guess it's true with with a comedy that you just you just don't know you don't know. I mean, you never know. You never know on any production. I mean, you were you played Jules Gates in the very first series of Line of Duty, which is one of my favorite series of of all time. Yeah. Did you know on that that Jed Mercurio had created a, a global sensation with this series? Was there a sense on the set that this was something unique, or? Did you not know? Is it impossible to sort of know in the moment? Yeah, I mean, I thought the scripts were great and um, and I thought it was a great show to be involved in and I really, uh, yeah, really enjoyed all of it. But, but no, I don't think I, I don't think I had any idea it would become what it did become. And um, yeah, and I think that's that's the strength of, of the writing and, and the actors that were in it, you know, for the long term. And yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it really did become so successful, didn't it? I think um, season by season, it grew and changed, didn't it? It took off in such an extreme way. I mean, you mentioned the scripts, and, and in addition to acting, you are yourself a writer and producer. What led you to to writing Born to Kill? I was living in Los Angeles, and um, my son was at school there, and one of the other mums at school... We got, we decided we thought we'd write, we'd try and write something together as we both had time there and um, we think we we sat by some swimming pool it sounds terrible and just were like what would we write about what but interests us both and we're both really interested in, in psychology and she'd written lots of shows with our husband that were were about crime and she had lots of crime books on her bookshelf there and um, so we started talking about psychopaths and as one does. Yes, yes, that's it. And then young ones, and then imagine if it was one of our sons or that sort of age range, and you think, what would a mother feel about that? So yeah, that's that was the starting point. And then we thought, yeah, let's just see if we can write it. And we actually originally set it in America before it got picked up here. We yeah, we planned to do it on the sort of Canadian American border where there was no one really paying Sam much attention. 
You've now amassed quite a few writing credits, in, including Man in Room 301, Born to Kill, which we mentioned. I mean, is writing something you'd like to do more of in the future? Do you, do you see yourself balancing acting roles with writing looking forward? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, in an ideal world, yes, because there's such different things to do and both have you know, positive and negative parts to them. You know, to do both would be the ideal, I think, yeah. So that begs the question, I guess, is is what is next for you, Kate? There's a, a couple of things I've just done. Um, I just did a film in Budapest, which was great fun as well, called Stockholm Bloodbath, based on a real bloodbath that happened years ago i think it was in the 1500s when norway was fighting sweden and then and then other things just see writing such a long process you know things are in different stages you know going uh going through that so i don't know what's what's going to actually be next Mm, i can't wait to see kate ashfield thank you so very much thank you Next time, Mary's illness puts life and love into perspective for those closest to her. What a privilege it was to witness the love they bear each other. Tom would be quite lost without her. Is that not what a marriage should be? Just because you called off your wedding doesn't mean I should call off mine. I know I'm making the right decision for my future. What about love? I will have my mother's love. That is enough. Sanditon stars Rose Williams and Crystal Clark return to the podcast Sunday, April 23rd to tie a neat ribbon around the final episode, reflect on what the series has meant to them as actors, and offer their final thoughts on how the story ended for Charlotte Haywood and Georgiana Lamb. Masterpiece Studio is hosted by me, Jay Slaycob, produced by Jack Pombriant, and edited by Robin Bissett. Alishaba Etup is our sound designer. The executive producer for Masterpiece is Suzanne Simpson. Hold up. 